And the Oscar goes to. Have you ever felt bad for giving a great review or recommendation to something that you know has its fair share of flaws? And not small flaws, but ones big enough that they actually hurt the final product a bit. That's certainly the case with today's film, a 1937 biographical drama that was nominated for a record 10 Oscars and won three. It's a picture with a slow, muddled start, but a nonetheless great story and out-of-this-world performance by its lead. The film follows real-life French author and activist Emile Zola, played by Paul Muni, and his involvement in the Dreyfus Affair, a scandal which lasted for 12 years and revolved around the false imprisonment of Captain Alfred Dreyfus, played by Joseph Sindelkraut, a man accused of passing on French military secrets to the German embassy. After being persuaded by Dreyfus' wife, played by Gail Sondergaard, to get involved in freeing her husband, Zola publishes a scathing letter, the famous I accuse, revealing the French military's corruption and is eventually put on trial for libel, where he hopes to reopen the Dreyfus case and expose the cover-up. The army is the people of France themselves, and the Dreyfus affair is a matter pertaining to that army. Dreyfus cannot be vindicated without condemning the whole general staff. That is why the general staff has screamed as to Harvey to demolish Dreyfus once more. Such then, Mr. President, is the simple truth. It is a fearful truth. But I affirm with intense conviction the truth is on the march and nothing will stop it. It was a landmark in French history and ultimately divided the nation. First things first, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a nitpick, but this film shouldn't be called The Life of Emil Zola. While yes, it does start out with his early life and tracks him through his rise to fame and fortune, through the publishing of his first book and his later writings, it then proceeds to focus on the setup for the Dreyfus plot. This eventually leads to Zola getting involved in the fight to free Dreyfus, which takes up the rest of the film. What does this have to do with the movie's title? The film at the end of the day is about Dreyfus and his unjust imprisonment, and not really about Zola's life. Yes, the affair was an extremely significant part of his life. However, little enough time is spent on his life, he often drops out of the film entirely for stretches at a time, for the picture to be more about the affair than Zola's life as a whole. I know I'm spending a lot of time harping on this, but it's important. A title represents the story. Most of the time is the first piece of the story we get, and it helps inform us on what we're about to read, listen to, or watch. A slightly misleading title can dampen enjoyment because we're not getting exactly what we were promised. The title as is makes me think the movie is going to be about Zola's life and focus mostly on him. Again, this is partly true, but not enough to justify the title. The film, I think, really should have been called The Dreyfus Affair, or Emo Zola and the Dreyfus Affair, or maybe even just Emo Zola, which could have suggested it featured Zola, but was not primarily about his life. Anyway, the plot structure I outlined isn't inherently a bad one for a film, but it takes about 30 minutes to get to the Dreyfus material, and another 30 or so just to get to the actual trial sequences. The depiction of Zola's younger days also come off as a bit unfocused and random at times. In retrospect, that first half hour is important, because it sets up who Zola is, how he got to be where he is, and why he would later be interested in the Dreyfus fiasco. It just takes a bit too long to do all that, drags the first quarter of the film down, and seems a little out of place when the rest of the picture centers mostly on Dreyfus. It would have been better, and I may get some hate for suggesting this, if the story had done a little more telling than showing. Hear me out on this. If the writers had started the film at a later point in his life, not a lot later, maybe just after Zola had published a few books, and had some of his backstory explained through dialogue and such, it would have pushed the beginning of the film forward and made the plot more concentrated. With that slightly long-winded rant out of the way, I have to admit the rest of the film is pretty darn awesome. The trial scenes, when we do finally get to them, are wonderfully written and a lot of fun to watch. You can feel the frustration from Zola's defense lawyer when all his questions are constantly thrown off by the judges, the corruptness of the system, and the ludicrousness of Dreyfus' conviction really coming out through the whole mess. Interestingly, I believe the somewhat ridiculous trial sequences weren't far off from what actually occurred. Hands down, the best part of the movie is Paul Muni as Zola. He totally disappears into the role, and what we get is an always interesting and sympathetic, smart, radical man who is always asking people to find the truth and seek justice. 
It's an extremely well-rounded performance with lots of little idiosyncrasies that make the character a real person with strengths and defects. With little help from some subtle but great makeup, he also handles the aging of the French writer quite well, slightly changing his posture and physical mannerisms as the character gets older. Even when he's sitting down and doing little more than twiddling his cane around, he is still able to invoke so much character into what he is doing that it makes every second he is on screen an utter joy. The height of Muni's powers is a scene near the end where he gives a speech in his defense to the jury and the court. The monologue is about four and a half minutes long, shot in one take, and he owns it the whole way through. It's a speech that encapsulates Zola's genius and his passion for truth and justice. If you're wary about watching the film, it's worth it for Muni and the speech alone. My profession is writing, not talking. But from my struggling youth until today, my principal aim has been to strive for truth. That is why I entered this fight. All my friends have told me that it was insane for a single person to oppose the immense machinery of the law, the glory of the army, and the power of the state. They warned me that my actions would be mercilessly crushed, that I would be destroyed. But what does it matter if an individual is shattered, if only justice is resurrected? The rest of the picture also contains great production values and good to excellent acting from the rest of the cast. The actor playing Dreyfus even won Best Supporting Actor for his performance. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, really. Like I said earlier, I feel a bit bad for ranking this so high, second place currently, in the best pictures I've watched so far, but it's simply very, very good. It demonstrates how a movie can have significant portions that don't work, but still have enough brilliance in it to override the bad. Simply put, it's a movie well worth seeing for its story about a critical time in French history, its cast and production, and the masterwork of Paul Muni. If you don't like the first half hour, stick with it. You'll be glad you did.